So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is the uh, this is the penultimate CSP seminar for this semester. Uh, so I would like to first thank uh, Shelly Falk and Patricia for helping organize it. Uh, without it, without her organizing it, it would be um, a, a skeleton of a shell of what it is. <clears throat> And I also want to thank uh, the, the KLA, the sponsor, and the two research groups, NCIS and uh, SIPA. So today, I'm um, delighted to, uh, to have Aditya Mahajan uh, speak. So Aditya has actually given a seminar quite a few years ago, so it's, uh, it would have been nice to have him in person, but hey, this is where we are. And Aditya also happens to be one of our, uh, I guess, uh, alumnus who's done very well. Well, let me start by introducing him and then we can take over. So, so Aditya is uh, currently an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at McGill University of Montreal, Canada. He's affiliated with the McGill Center of Intelligent Machines, CIM, Montreal Institute of Learning, Algorithms, MILA, and the Group for Research and Decision Analysis, RILA. He received his uh, B.Tech in Electrical Engineering from the Ministry of Technology, Kanpur, uh, India in 2003. And after that, he's, uh, he's spent quite a few years in our work. From what I hear, he wasn't doing too much. Um, he had too much time. <laughs> and it's, uh, but he did manage to get an MS and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science um, in 2006 and 2008. Uh, from 2008 to 2010, he was a postdoc researcher in the electrical engineering department at Yale um, in Connecticut. And, uh, uh, from, and from then, he has, since then, he has been at McGill. And in the middle, he took a sabbatical and spent a year at Berkeley in 2016 to So he is a recipient of the 2015 George Axel the Outstanding Paper Award. This was for the work on uh, common information uh, for team problems. And the 2016 NSERC Discovery Accelerator 2014 CDC Best Student Paper Award. And also the 2016 Nexus Best Student Paper Award, again, as a super. His uh, principal research interests include decentralized stochastic control, team theory, reinforcement learning, multi bandits, and information theory, as well as game theory and dynamic games. Today he's going to talk, tell us about reinforcement uh, learning. So the floor is all yours. Thanks, Vijay. Thank you for the invitation and the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the recent work that we did on approximate planning and learning in partially observed systems. And let me start by uh, acknowledging uh, my PhD student, Jay Kumar Supramanian. Uh, this is the main component of Chetumar's PhD thesis, and he's responsible for uh, many of the key ideas in here. Uh, I was, I'm was, i just doing yeah, so the popularization of the task. Uh, the sound is cracking okay. a little bit, but I don't know what that, uh, I think Achilles also pointed that out, but I think I was going to mention that too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just uh, let me connect to my... Sometimes Bluetooth does um, that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just going to change my network. Sorry about that. Just no, no problem. So yeah, while Aditya is uh, rejoining, maybe I should just give it. So, uh, so please feel uh, free to ask questions. You can put it on chat or raise your hand and then I'll allow you to ask your question. And the way we're gonna run it is once Aditya finishes, I'll have the discussions go on. He will respond to them and then uh, we'll open up the broader question. 
just so that the discussions were prepared so, so they can actually um, go through what they prepared. Sorry about this. Uh... There is still some crackling, but maybe we should go on. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, I'll just continue and let me know if it becomes terribly bad. Usually, sure. Zoom has been OK. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, this is joint work with my uh, uh, former PhD student, Jay Kumar Subramanian, and uh, Amit Sena and uh, Rehan Siraj. Uh, so the motivation for this is coming from reinforcement learning. In uh, recent years, reinforcement learning algorithms have achieved considerable success in applications ranging from being able to beat the world master in the game of Go uh, to being able to play arcade games as well as humans or being able to solve, for example, grasping tasks in robotics and many, many others. Uh, these algorithms are based on comprehensive theory. However, for the most part, the theory is restricted almost exclusively to systems with perfect state observation. Uh, recent, uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms are increasingly being applied to real world applications such as healthcare, financial trading, self-driving cars, uh, smart grids, and others. And often, more often than not, uh, these real-world applications are partially observed. So uh, due to the lack of a good theoretical understanding of partially observed systems, uh, RL algorithms, when they're applied to uh, partially observed environments, they're uh, applied in an ad hoc manner. Uh, the, in this talk, I want to explain what is the main difficulty with learning in partially observed environments. And then I'll present my recent results on reinforcement learning in partially observed environments and explain what is our key idea to resolve these difficulties. Um, uh, which is, is the sound OK now or still crackling? It's still crackling. So I mean, part of it is sometimes because of uh, uh, it's it, it usually Bluetooth can cause problems. I have seen that happen. Yeah, no, I'm not for for the audio. Yeah, I'm audio. I thought I was connected through my system and not through Bluetooth. Um, Maybe you can try cutting your video off. Just your, I mean, keep the screen, but just your. Uh... Yeah, I think that is off. I'm not sure. Um, no. We Aditya, we can see your face, so you're not off. Your video is not off. Can you turn off your video? Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if this improves things. Okay. Uh, is, is the sound better or no? Yeah. Okay. Better. I guess yeah. I'll continue. So uh, let's start by uh, a review of planning in partially observed environments. And by planning, I mean systems in which we know the system model. So planning problem in partially observed environments is uh, modeled using the mathematical framework of partially observable Markov decision processes, or POMDPs. Uh, in this framework, the system consists of an environment um, and an agent. The environment has a state, which I'll denote by S a subscript T belonging to some set S. Uh, the agent makes a observation, a noisy observation of the state of the environment, and the observation I denote by Y T belonging to some set Y. And then the agent takes an action A T belonging to some set A. We are given the system dynamics and observation function. So the dynamics are some transition distribution on the next state given the current state and action. And the observations are probability distribution of the observations given the state. And there is a first step reward function, which depends on the current state and actions. 
the action is chosen according to a control law or a policy or a control law which looks at the history of all previous observations and the history of all previous actions we choose the current action the collection of these control laws over time is called a policy and i'm interested in choosing a policy to maximize the expected discounted total reward uh, so uh, the key conceptual challenge in this setup is that the state of the environment is partially observed by the agent because of this uh, the actions are chosen as a function of the entire history and therefore the since the history is increasing in time the complexity of the search for finding the optimal policy increases exponentially in time in the literature the standard approach to circumvent this conceptual difficulty is to use a belief state a belief state is a it's a uh, distribution valued random variable which is the posterior distribution of the state of the system given the history of observations and actions key properties of the belief state are one that it updates in a state like manner the belief at the next time step is a deterministic function of the current belief the, the next observation and the current action and second is that the belief is sufficient to evaluate the current reward that is if i look at the expectation of the current reward conditioned on the history of belief and all actions including the current action it is some function of the current belief and the current action these two properties imply that the belief state is a perfectly observed controlled markov chain or controlled markov process and this has two implications first we can argue that there is no loss of optimality in choosing the action as a function of the current belief rather than the entire history and second we can write down a belief valued dynamic program uh, i'll not pass the dynamic program but this is the standard dynamic program given the evolution of the belief and pretending that the first step rewards are a function of the belief and the uh, actions so therefore uh, as far as planning problems are concerned that is problems in which we know the system model uh, this belief based uh, argument allows us to use the entire machinery of fully observed macro decision processes for partially observed systems uh, this results in an explosion of the state space but by now there is a very good understanding of uh, various exact and approximate algorithms to compute an optimal or approximately optimal policy so as far as uh, planning in partially observed systems is concerned there is little value in looking for formulations beyond the belief state formulation however the situation is very different for learning so learning refers to a situation where i may not know the system model but i may be interacting with the environment to learn the uh, to learn the system model or learn how to act optimally in such a scenario the very construction of a belief state depends on the system model and since i do not know the system model uh, we cannot construct the belief state and therefore all this nice theory about having a dynamic programming decomposition based on the belief state is not applicable so what has happened in the literature is that there have been two approaches which has been taken on the theoretical side of things Uh, people have proposed alternate methods uh, the most uh, uh, important amongst them are predictive state representations by simulation metrics and others these have uh, very good theoretical guarantees uh, but their uh, practical implementation side hasn't been uh, hasn't been studied too much therefore they, they are difficult to scale to large scale problems on the other hand on the practical side uh people use a lot of tricks to pretend that the system looks like a mdp so there are examples like stacking previous day observations to treat it as a state this is how atari games uh, the optimal policy for atari games is learned 
or simply uh, there would be simply take the neural network in the policy or value function approximation and replace it by a recurrent neural network uh, with sufficient hyperparameter tuning and effort these methods can be made to work well but then we lose all the theoretical convergence guarantees as well as the insights provided by the theory so the main motivation for this talk is to present a theoretically grounded method for reinforcement learning in partially observable models which has strong empirical performance uh, for high dimensional environments uh, this is based on a recent paper which is uh, uh, available on archive and the code for this paper is also available on github so uh, in the rest of the talk, this is the high-level view of how I'm going to present things. Uh, I'll start with an overview of information state. It's a classical concept in stochastic control, but perhaps this is not as well known, and therefore I'm just uh, reiterating uh, what information state is. Uh, informally, it's going to be a sufficient statistic which can be recursively updated. And a key feature of an information state is that it always leads to a dynamic programming decomposition. The main idea of our approximation is what we call an approximate information state. And for defining an approximate information state, we look at an information state, which is defined in terms of two properties. And we say, if these two properties hold approximately, we'll call it an approximate information state. We show that in AIS, as we'll abbreviate it, always leads to an approximate dynamic program. And we'll be able to get uh, approximation bound for these dynamic programs. And using that, we'll recover or improve upon many of the existing results in the literature. And finally, I'll show how we can use the idea of approximate information state to develop our reinforcement learning algorithms and uh, compare the performance of our algorithm with the uh, state-of-the-art uh, reinforcement learning algorithms for POMDPs. Um, so are there any questions before I continue? I don't see any, so please go. Okay, all right. So the next, before going into the technical discussion, let me start by the modeling framework. And we're going to take a slightly different approach rather than working with the modeling framework of POMDPs. I'm simply going to use an input output modeling framework. And it turns out that this is actually conceptually simpler if I want to talk about approximations. So my modeling framework is that I'm going to think of my stochastic system as an input output system. There are two inputs, the control input, which is the current action, and the stochastic input, which is some noise. I'll assume that the stochastic input is independent across time. And the system generates two outputs. One, I'll just call the output yt, and the second is a reward rt. In general, both the output and the reward are some functions of all the past inputs of the system, both control inputs and the stochastic inputs. So the sequence in which these events are generated is that the agent inputs an action at to the system, Nature generates noise W1, and the system generates output Y1 and R1. Then agent generates A2, nature generates W2, system generates Y2, R2, and so on. This is a slightly different timing diagram than POMDPs, but it's relatively easy to translate between them. So I'll just work with this uh, uh, timing information uh, for the rest of the talk. I'm going to denote HT, which is all the data available to the agent before it makes the decision at time T as the history at time T. And we'll assume that the agent chooses an action as a, a, some randomized function of the history HT, where this randomization is independent of everything else. As before, the control policy is the collection of all the uh, 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 all these control laws over time, and the objective is to maximize the expected discounted uh, total reward. So uh, let me now start with a description of an information state. So first, let's go back and look at the definition of sufficient statistics. 
Let me assume that I have a situation in which there is some state S, there is an agent which gets an observation Y, and chooses some action A. Uh, so a function Z of Y, uh, so sigma is some compression of Y, we say such a compression is a sufficient statistic uh, for the purpose of evaluating the reward, which I denote by R, so there's some reward which depends on state and action. So Z is a sufficient statistic for the purpose of evaluating reward if condition P1 is satisfied, which states that if I look at the expected value of the reward conditioned on the observation and action, that should, same, that should be the same as the expected value of the reward conditioned on the sufficient statistic and the action. This also is same as saying that the right hand side is some deterministic function of the sufficient statistic and the action. So this is the central idea used in uh, most of uh, statistical decision making. Now, if we want to generalize the idea of sufficient statistics to optimization over time, so let us consider a POMDP. And suppose I identified a sufficient statistic at time t for evaluating the reward at time t, and I identified a sufficient statistic at time t plus one for evaluating the reward at time t plus one. The basic question is, is such a sufficient statistic sufficient for obtaining a dynamic programming decomposition? And the answer is no. To solve a dynamic program, we need to be able to compute the expectation of the current reward and the expected value function at the next time condition on the current history and action. So if I just have a sufficient statistic for RT, then I will not be able to compute the expected cost to go function. In order to compute the expected cost to go function, I need to be able to predict the distribution of the next information state. Uh, so I should have a property which I'll call P2, that the distribution of the next information state conditioned on the history and actions should just be a function, should, uh, I can replace the history by the sufficient statistic. So for a sufficient statistic to be sufficient for dynamic programming, it should satisfy property P1, so it should be sufficient to predict rewards, but at the same time, it should satisfy an additional property that it should be sufficient to predict itself. Okay. So informally, an information state is a compression of the history, which is sufficient for performance evaluation and predicting itself. Formally, if I'm given a Banach space set, and a collection of history compression functions, which map the history to Z. We say this collection of history compression functions is an information state generator. If we can identify a reward function R hat and a transition kernel P hat, such that the properties P1 and P2 that I just identified are satisfied with R hat and P hat. So if I can construct a state space model where the state is the information state, and the first step reward is the expected reward conditioned on all the history, we have an information state. And a key property of the information state is that if I identify any information state, I can write down a corresponding dynamic program for the transition kernel and the reward function that we identified as part of the information state. And if we pick a policy which maximizes the right hand side of this equation, and compose it with the history compression, I get a policy which is optimal in the original model. So just by satisfying these two properties, I can write down a dynamic programming decomposition and identify an optimal policy. And I would argue that this is the fundamental idea for dynamic programming, which is used all over the literature. If you look at the classical result for Markov decision processes, one can show that the current state is an information state and you recover the, oh, I'm getting some echo. Um, yeah, can any, everyone mute themselves, please? There's some echo coming here. Oh, actually, actually, um, 
Hello, there's some there's some Sorry. chat going on in the back. Can you please mute it? Okay, thanks. So in uh, Markov decision processes, the current state is an information state. If we take Markov decision processes with delayed observations, we can show that the delayed state and the actions from the time that I have my observations to the current time, this collection forms an information state. If we look at POMDPs, we can show that the belief state is an information state. If we look at POMDPs with delayed observations, we can show that the belief on the delayed state plus the actions taken since the time that I have my observation is an information state. If we look at linear quadratic systems, the state estimate can be shown to be an information state. If we look at specific models like machine maintenance, we can find simpler information state for those. So these are these various results scattered all over the literature, which essentially are identifying an information state for a specific system. So this is a general way for thinking of what are the conditions in which I can get a dynamic programming decomposition. So now let me come to the main idea, which is that of an approximate information state. So recall that there were these two properties, P1 and P2, which defined information state. So we'll say an approximate information state, and I'll call that an epsilon delta approximate information state, is a collection of history compression functions, a reward approximator, and a transition approximator if it satisfies property P1 and P2 approximately. So what I mean by that is, in P1, I wanted the expected reward to be equal to R hat. Now I want the distance between them to be less than epsilon. In P2, I wanted the you know, distribution of the next information state to be equal to P hat, conditioned on the current information state and action. And now I want the distance between them to be less than delta. So whenever I have a generative model, that is a model for uh, rewards and uh, transition kernels, along with history compression functions such that P1 and P2 are satisfied approximately, I'm going to call that an approximate information state. That is one part of this definition which requires us to be a bit more careful and that is I'm talking about distance between probability measures. So th the choice of an AIS will depend on the choice of the distance between probability measures. And there are various choices of how I choose a metric on the space of probability measures. For example, total variation, watch time distance, bounded Lipschitz metrics, and so on. We are going to work with a class of metrics known as the integral probability metrics which I'll abbreviate to IPM. And these are a class of metrics which are defined with respect to a class of functions which I'll denote by F. And our precise bounds will depend on a quantity which is called the Minkowski functional, which corresponds to that functional class. And I'll explain what I mean by these terms next. So an IPM is like a dual probability distance. So given a function, given a measurable space X and a class of functions from F to X, an IPM between two points, two distributions, mu and nu, is given by the supremum of the expectation of a function F with respect to mu minus the expectation with respect to nu, where the supremum is over all functions belonging to that function class. Uh, for different choices of function class F, we recover different uh, classical uh, distributions between probabilities. For example, if the function class was all functions whose soup norm is less than one, we recover total variation. If the function class is all functions whose Lipschitz constant is less than one, we recover watch time distance and so on. One important quantity that we will work with is the Minkowski functional corresponding to a function class. That simply says that if I give you a function which does not lie to that functional class, what is the smallest amount by which I should scale this function, that I should scale down this function so that it belongs to the function class. So if I have something whose soup norm was 10, then the Minkowski uh, constant with respect to total variation would be 10 because if I scale it by 10, its soup norm will become less than one. 
thing. So armed with this definition, I can now say, suppose I have a AIS and I write down the dynamic program corresponding to that AIS. So this will be uh, some fixed point equation corresponding to R hat and P hat. And suppose through some other means, I'm able to identify the optimal value function uh, in the original partially observed model. And I'm not going to worry about how we can do that, but let's say someone comes and tells you what's the best performance you could have gotten. Our main result is that if I have any AIS, uh, I get two results. One is the value function approximation, that the value function we had, which we solved using this dynamic program, uh, the distance between the true value function and the approximate value function is less than a constant which I call alpha. And this constant depends on epsilon and delta, which were the epsilon delta parameters in the definition of my uh, approximate information state. It depends on gamma, which was the discount factor in the dynamic program. And it depends on the Minkowski functional of the value function for the approximate model. So this will depend on the choice of my IPM. If I was working with Wasserstein distance, rho f will be the Lipschitz constant. If I'm working with total variation, this will be the soup norm and so on. But for a particular choice of function plus, and therefore the particular choice of IPM, I get that approximately solving this model gives me a value function which is close to the true value function. At the same time, if I pick the policy which corresponds to the optimal policy for this approximate dynamic program, and I use that policy in the original model, we can show that the loss in performance is not greater than two alpha, where alpha is the same parameter as for value function approximation. So simply by identifying an information, so picking an IPM, identifying an information state with respect to that IPM, I very, very simply get approximation bound for value function approximation and policy approximation. And these are very, very simple analysis. This is just repeated application of Bellman operator and the definitions of uh, IPM. So let me give you examples to show why this type of general bounds are useful. So I'm going to look at classical results in the literature and view them as special cases of uh, AIS. So Aditya, just before I start that, with the question. So I had a sure, quick question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So your IPM is basically supreme over the function class. So you would, I mean, to actually make it somewhat useful, you would need uh, the sort of duality result, right? So this is equivalent to some distance over a coupling. Of the, or you don't need it. Um, I don't need it. Uh, so. For no, now, to make it I'm useful in the sense, the because how do I evaluate the supremum over a function class which is complex? And how do I ensure that is true? That's where I was going. Yes, with. so yes, so I need a IPM which is computationally easy to work with. Uh, and I'll come to that in a bit when I start talking about reinforcement learning. Um, so uh, for now, uh, yes, so that is there that for this to be useful, I need a way to evaluate the IPM to say how good or bad my model is. Mm -hmm. For at least common choices, like for uh, total variation and Wasserstein distance, uh, this can be computed by solving a linear program. For something like maximum mean discrepancy, which depends on the choice of a a recursive kernel Hilbert space, uh, the IPM is actually given in closed form depending on the samples from the distributions. Uh, so for specific choices, uh, things may be easy. So in practice, I'll have to work with one of the IPMs which are computationally tractable. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking if you have the the like the duality result, many of these things have the duality result, and then basically it just says that you need to have some coupling, because that then becomes an infimum over all couplings of the two distributions, and then that gives you a bound basically, right? So I pick any coupling, it will do well. Right. 
Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is also there. That is something we actually did not explore. Um, but yes, I agree that if we take an IPM which which has the duality with respect to coupling, then I don't need to optimally solve this. I can get an upper bound on the distance, and that will work as well for our uh, for our purposes. Um, but that's something that we did not explore. So that's a very interesting suggestion. Yeah. Uh, are, are there other questions? Uh, I don't see any. Uh, please proceed. Okay. Uh, is the quality audio quality variable now or not? It's still crackling, but I think it's. I think we've. At least I have managed to tune to it, so I can filter it. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what is happening. This has not happened before, so. Uh, okay. Um, so I'll start with some examples of AIS. Uh, so actually, let me try one thing. Um, so let me think of the following problem, uh, which I'll call robustness to model mismatch in MDPs. Suppose I have a real world model, uh, which I'll denote, this is in an MDP, so I have a real world model P and R, and suppose I build a simulation model P hat and R hat. Uh, one often would do a system design using the simulation model, and is interested in the question that what will be the loss in performance if we choose a policy using the simulation model and take that policy in the real world, how much do we lose by doing that? And an AIS provides us a immediate answer to this. Uh, so if I pick any function class and define, an, uh, uh, I can define epsilon and delta. Epsilon will be the maximum distance between R and R hat and delta will be the maximum distance between p and p hat, but that distance will depend on the choice of my function class. And immediately by using the previous formula, I get a bound with how much am I losing if I use the policy from the approximate model in the real model. If I take specific instances of it, so if I choose the function class uh, such that the distance is total variation, we recover, I'll not pass this expression, but simply say we recover the bounds which are presented in Mueller on uh, sensitivity of MDPs to transition kernels. Uh, if we pick this as the washer sign distance, uh, then we recover uh, the recent bounds of Asadi, Misra, and Lickman on approximation errors for uh, uh, in terms of washer sign distances. So this gives us a very, very easy way to recover some of the approximation results in the literature. Uh, let me look at a slightly different variation of this problem. So oftentimes in MDPs with large state spaces, what is commonly done is that one uses a feature map phi, which maps the state space into some smaller state space S hat. Uh, the choice of this feature map also maps the model P and R into an approximate model P hat and R hat. And one asks the same question. If I design according to this approximate uh, model and use it in the real model, how much do I lose? And uh, again, I can define an epsilon and delta for a particular choice of uh, function class. Uh, here, the choice of delta depends a bit on how p hat is constructed from p. But again, I'm not going to pass that. That's not important. But given the specific way in which we construct p hat from p, we can identify what the maximum bound is between the two distributions. And through these epsilon and deltas, we again immediately get a bound on the loss of performance. And if I pick DF as total variation, we get uh, a particular bound which improves uh, a similar bound proposed in Abel and all by a factor of one minus gamma. Abel and all had similar things, but there was an additional one upon one minus gamma upfront both terms. And through the AIS analysis, we see that that is not needed. If we take this distance as Washerstein distance, 
We recovered a recent result by Gelada et al. on deep MDPs, which was exploiting uh, the Lipschitz constant of the value function. And again, question. for, yeah. Uh, when you do this feature extraction, you still have to show that the, the resulting approximate state S hat can be updatable, right? No, I can just pretend that there is an update function P hat. So ah, in, I see. It, it does not need to satisfy the Markov property. Okay. I just need to assume a Markov kernel when I'm doing the uh, when I'm solving the dynamic program arbitrarily, and this will uh, cost arbitrarily. Data. Yes. I see. If if I do a poor job, then then I'll have a very bad approximation. Got it. Thank you very so, much. In in the framework that I'm saying, I'm not actually saying whether these bounds are good or bad. If I do a terrible job with my approximate model, these bounds may be meaningless. Thank you. Uh, but if I have a good approximation, then I have patience. So the last example is uh, that of uh, a belief approximation in POMDPs. So one often takes that the belief state is a continuous space. So I may discretize it in some way. Uh, and I may use this finite state model now to solve uh, to compute the a policy and use that policy in the original model. Uh, for this type of construction, there's a recent paper by Francois Levet and all who define what they call epsilon sufficient statistics, which is that we define a compression function of the history phi, and we define a belief based on compressed history. And we say that this collection of B and phi is an epsilon sufficient statistic if the total variation between the approximate belief and the true belief is less than epsilon. So we can actually take their definition and show that anything which is an epsilon sufficient statistic would also be an AIS with respect to the bounded Lipschitz metric with an appropriate choice of epsilon and delta. And we can use this in the previous bound that I presented uh, with, with AIS and we can get a particular bound for this type of approximation. Again, I'll not pass this bound in detail, but I just want to point out that France, we get an improvement of one over one minus gamma with the result of Francois Levet et al. Also, this particular improvement is not surprising because there is a part of the proof of uh, the paper by Francois Levet where they use the previous results that I mentioned where we improve the bound by one minus gamma. So this is simply that uh, uh, improvement carrying over. But the point that I do want to emphasize is that by looking at all these approximations through the lens of an approximate information state, we get a unified view of looking at these approximation results, both for MDPs and POMDPs. So Aditya, I had a question Any? here. Sure. So, so your, uh, your approximation there, epsilon delta, it's somewhat it's uniform in the Straight, right? And there's mm -hmm. no necessity to do that. I mean, I could, I mean, I could have a, I mean, you have a sort of an absolute error in a way. I could think of relative errors. I could think of things that are for certain states where the reward is high. I, I get a better, yes. um, better approximation. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so we, we have some back of the envelope calculation. Essentially, if you have non uniform error, you can still get similar bounds uh, in terms of the, you need to average over that non-uniform error in some sense. So I need to define the approximation with respect to some kind of averaging. And if I do that, I can get uh, similar results with non-uniform errors also. So the basic results do go through uh, uh, both for MDPs and POMDPs. Okay, thank you. So finally coming to how do we do reinforcement learning based on this? So the high level idea is very simple. I have now these two error bounds, epsilon and delta. So I can just think of epsilon and delta as a surrogate loss function and try to construct an information state which minimizes epsilon and delta. In particular, I can try to construct what we call an AIS generator. This AIS generator consists of two parts. There is
there is an AIS encoder, which looks at actions and observations and tries to generate an AIS out of that. And an AIS decoder or an AIS predictor, which looks at the current AIS and the current action and tries to generate a expected reward and a distribution on the next AIS. The AIS encoder has to be a recurrent network if I'm using this using neural networks because this is something which is mapping history to AIS. The AIS decoder can be a regular neural network or any other class of function approximators that you like. So once I have an AIS generator, I can associate a loss with this AIS generator and I take the weighted mean squared error as the loss. So my error is R tilde T minus RT, which is which we were calling epsilon. So I can take epsilon squared plus delta squared as the error. The advantage of working with squared error is when I look at the this distance between two distributions and look at the derivative of this distance with respect to the parameterization, for certain choices of uh, IPMs, the derivative of the square is actually very easy to compute or very easy to upper bound. So in the paper, we show that for Wasserstein distance or maximum mean discrepancy, the derivative of the square can be computed efficiently. Uh, we did not think of the idea which Vijay had mentioned that we might just pick a specific few samples from S to get an upper bound on DF, in which case we might just be able to combine these things without necessarily taking squares, uh, but it's also sometimes how these things perform empirically. So once I have an AIS generator, then you can just plug it in with your favorite RL algorithm. So suppose you had an actor critic algorithm which had some critic which was a value function approximator, which typically would use something like uh, the temporal difference loss as the loss function, so we can add that which takes the AIS as the state. And I can add a policy network if it was there, which may again take the AIS as a state and generate an action. And for the policy network, the uh, one would compute, compute the gradient using the policy gradient theorem. If one wants to do something, some kind of regularization in this to explore, uh, ex uh, to encourage uh, exploration and so on, all that can be part of whatever RL algorithm we are picking here. You simply take this AIS generator, plug it in into any of the standard RL algorithms. And the main idea is if we update the AIS generator either at the fastest time scale or the slowest time scale, then we can have a separation of time scales and using choosing learning rates as governed by the uh, multi time scale stochastic approximation theory, we can guarantee that. Uh, uh, this simultaneously learning these three things will converge. And uh, uh, we need some under appropriate technical conditions, we can show this converges. The convergence point will depend on the choice of the function approximators that we pick. So we are not guaranteeing that it will converge to the quote unquote optimal because that will depend on what the size of Z is and what size of function spaces we are using. But within that we'll converge to uh, necessarily converge to a good local minima and under strong technical conditions also converge to a global value. And conceptually that's it. Others are just figuring out the details for how to do these things uh, correctly. And uh, I'm a bit over time, but I just want to present few numerical examples which are motivated by this mini grid environment. Um, so in the paper, we have other examples as well. The mini grid one is uh, one of the most complicated one that we looked at. These are a collection of partially observable 2D grids. In this, the agent has a seven cross seven view in front of that. So here, for example, the agent is seeing seven cross seven, but if there are walls, the agent cannot see through walls. If there is a gap in the wall, only then the agent can see through it. And these are complicated environments in which the agent has to move, pick up items, drop items, and so on. Uh, we are going to empirically compare the performance of two variants of AIS. One is AIS based with MMD. This is the uh, RKHS based IPM. And second is AIS plus KL, which is the Wasserstein variant of AIS, but we use KL divergence as an upper bound for Wasserstein distance so that KL divergence can be computed more easily than Wasserstein distance. And the third baseline will 
compared with is PPO plus LFTM, which is a baseline which was proposed for this specific environment in the paper which introduced this environment. So that's sort of uh, one of the best algorithms in the literature for this environment. And let me start by sort of one environment which is known as simple crossing and sort of on the left, I'm showing the le uh, learned agent and it executing the policy over different environments. And on the right are the performance curves. The orange one is AIS plus MMD, purple one is AIS plus KL, and the green one is PPO. And somehow this nomenclature S9 means it's a nine cross nine environment, S11 means it's an 11 cross envi 11 environment, so it's some proxy for the complexity. And we see for small scale environments, all three algorithms learn reasonably well. For large scale environments, PPO does not really work, while other algorithms, uh, can, uh, the AIS based algorithms are still able to learn this environment. Uh, let's go to something more complicated, which is, uh, as you can see from this video, this is an environment where there, is a, there are doors and keys and the agent has to learn that it has to open doors to find the key and then go to the door which opens to the key, drop the key and then pick up the report. And keep in mind that the agent can only see what is in the yellow area in front of it. If there is a door, it cannot see. And again, we see that the AIS based agent is able to learn reasonably well. In this particular environment, PPO does not learn at all. Uh, this particular benchmark of mini grid was proposed as a benchmark for continual learning. That the idea was that you need to learn how to open a door and then use that algorithm to learn that pick up a key and open a door and so on. Uh, but here we can do end to end learning just by AIS and using one of the simplest RL algorithms. Uh, here's another one which is obstructed maze in which the object is in another room and the agent has to learn to pick up the key, open the door, drop the key and go to the object. And again, AIS based methods are able to learn in this environment while PPO does not do any learning. So to summarize, uh, we are looking Actually, at- Aditya, sure. there was a question on the uh, on the plot on this yep. simulations that you showed. Was, does the agent also see its reward at each time like in standard reinforcement learning? It seems yeah, so like the, in this case, the agent the sees the- yeah, the agent does see the reward. Uh, the reward is only when the agent reaches the goal state. So uh, there's just the reward of uh, plus one at the end uh, and no reward in the intermediate steps. And the reward can be part of the observation. I guess that's a question that there was there. Can we simply see it as part of the observation? Uh, yes, uh, we could see it as a part of the observation as well. Uh, it does get a, like a high dimensional video, uh, high dimensional uh, input, which is the, this observable grid and a real number, which tells what the reward is, which is either zero or one in this case. So maybe I'm not understanding the spirit of the question. No, I guess it was just that, could you think of the rewards? I mean, you had separated the rewards from the observations and- uh, I see, I see. Uh, yes, uh, the reason we separate that is because I only want, I need to be able to predict the expected reward. I don't want necessarily have to predict any other component of the observation. So we separate it because we are specifically looking to predict the expected value of the reward. I could uh, alternatively have defined things such that I predict the distribution of the observations rather than the distribution of the information state, in which case uh, I don't need to make that distinction. But when I'm just predicting the information state, it's actually uh, nicer to keep the reward separate so that we only predict the expected value of the reward. Thanks. Okay, so to summarize, I'm looking at partially observed uh, environments where we do have a standard solution for planning, which involves the belief state, uh, but the belief state does not work for learning. So we are looking at the notion of information state, which provides a dynamic programming decomposition in general for any partially observed environment. Uh, based on the information state, we are defining an approximate information state. And the key property of an approximate information state is that it gives me an approximate dynamic program 
with bounded losses in the value function evaluation and the policy evaluation. And if I take these losses as a surrogate loss and use that in a standard RL setup, I get decent performance in a large class of partially observed environments. Uh, so I think that this is a very nice and conceptually clean framework to think about approximate dynamic programming and online learning in partially observed systems. Uh, in the paper, we have other constructions which include generalizations to observation compression, action quantization, and lifelong learning, which I did not present here. We also include a generalization to multi-agent systems in the paper. And uh, I've been thinking about sort of using these ideas for other forms of reinforcement learning as well, including offline RL, model-based RL, inverse RL, and others. And I feel that this can be a building block for multi-agent RL, and that's a direction that we are currently exploring. Um, so with that, I'll stop, and I'll be happy to take questions. So yes, as I mentioned, let's uh, let's have the discussions come on, and then we'll have open it up for questions. So uh, whichever order, Su and Deng Wang, you want to go, go ahead, please. May I go ahead and ask a question, PJ? If it's a short one, short answer one, because I, I do want to give them okay. time, but yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, well, if it's short or not, it, uh, I think depends on it, yeah. So, <laughs> Thank you. Very nice work. I, I, I get the approximation part, but in the context of mm -hmm. a single agent reinforcement learning, which can be completely model free, right? Where, mm -hmm. uh, where, where does the gain come from? So if you compare this to just standard through data edit, you know, approach, um, where does the gain come so, from? So the point is this, right? So suppose let's take this example of this uh, particular uh, uh, environment where the agent is only observing this seven cross, partially observing the seven cross seven uh, grid in front of it. It is not an MDP because it has partial observation. So there is no standard theory on how do I do RL here? I mean, I'm, I'm, there are ways ah, on how okay. do I do RL. Okay. So but you, they, they are using like other forms of uh, PFRs or by simulation metric. In the standard state space model, there is no way of doing RL. So you, you get convergence, you get theoretical results. Empirically, mm -hmm. do you beat the model-free, purely data-based method? Um, is that just, is this PP? It is very hard to make that comparison fairly uh, okay. because a uh, lot of the, uh, to get the best, so for these models, uh, we actually do, like the ones that I presented, but if I go to like robotic tasks, which we were unable to evaluate because we don't have the hardware, mm. but there is a lot of work on partially observed robotics where people do very, very similar ideas, and they use a lot of other tricks to ensure that the algorithms mm. work well. Okay. So, so I mean, in principle, because I'm not preventing a particular algorithm, right? I can add all those same mm -hmm. tricks to the AIS. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I can claim whatever the other person is doing is in some sense an AIS. So mm -hmm. I can make a broad claim that all of those algorithms are actually doing an AIS-like thing, whether they want to call it that or not. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there is this world model paper from a couple of years ago by Schmidt Huber's group, which can be viewed as an AIS. There's a lot of work from uh, Berkeley's uh, uh, group on uh, model-based uh, deep RL, which could be viewed as AIS. So uh, they, they also have a lot of other features and we could add same things in the RL algorithm part. Okay. So yes. I'm looking more at it from conceptually rather than trying to get into this uh, dog race of uh, who's yeah. giving the best performance. <laughs> I get it. Thanks, Aditya. Sure, thank you. So I think there was one question for Achilles, which was that how large was the AIS in this example? Um, so I don't remember. The state space here is you are getting something like, if I remember correctly, 
3 to the power of 147 is my discrete state of observations. We actually do a compression of that before running it through an AIF, and we compress it to R to the 40, if I remember correctly, but I could be wrong. And then I think we choose an AIS, which is R to the 40 or R to the 50. I don't remember the exact numbers on the top of my head, but I can look it up from the paper. Thanks. All right, so I guess we'll go to the discussions. How do you guys want to go? Uh, who wants to go first? Yeah, maybe I can go first. Sure, yeah. go ahead. You're first. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me share. Okay. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I want to uh, re revisit what uh, what is talked about in this paper through the tiger environment. So let me uh, describe the environment first. So the environment basically comes from the story that the king asking a man to choose between two doors. And um, so where the princess is behind one door and the tiger is behind the other, of course, the objective is to find the door that hides the princess. And um, the tiger roars, so the man can wait for a while and choose a door that the roaring sound doesn't come from. So formerly we have uh, two states, uh, SL and SR, and two observations, OL and OR, coming from the states passing through a noi noisy binary symmetric channel. Uh, when the state is SL, you will see, basically you will see OL more frequently and vice versa. So there are two actions, AL and AR, and um, when the action matches the state, we get a reward, and if it doesn't match, then we'll get a penalty. And there's a third action, which is uh, AW, which means that we just wait and get a more observation with a small waiting post. <clears throat> so uh, whenever agent takes a peek, the, the tiger um, or the state will be reset independently. Otherwise the state will uh, not evolve. So the um, I have an example that the reward penalty and waiting cost are 10 uh, minus 100 and minus one correspondingly. So um, by model, I mean the tuple of reward function transition kernel and in the Pandi Ping case, uh, the observation kernel as well. So if we consider an MDP, which corresponding to the case that the binary symmetric channel is not noisy, uh, if we know the model, then you can basically, you can basically solve it with uh, dynamic programming. And if you don't know the model, you can use uh, common reinforcement learning where you just try different actions in different states and find the optimal policy. Um, yeah, but in the PongDB case, if you know the model, you can actually transform it back to MDP using the belief state. So in the tiger example, the belief state is just um, the probability of, um, of this state being um, SR conditioning on the, uh, all the action observation history. So you can imagine in the optimal policy that if this probability is small enough, then you will choose a left door. And if it's big enough, you will choose the right door. And in the middle, you will wait. And um, an equivalent information state is basically the number of right observations mi minus the number of left observations. So you will get a, basically a thresholding rule here. So if the uh, information state is smaller than minus two, you will choose left. Larger than two, you will choose right. And between minus one and one, you will choose uh, wait. So th uh, this is an example where from the last reset, we <clears throat> uh, from the last reset, you, you, you see the 10 rewards here. We see two left, left observation and one right observation. So the information state is uh, minus one. So the main idea of uh, is basically the information state is an encapsulation of the AOH. 
So now if we consider the PongDB without knowing the model, we can't actually form the belief state because forming the belief state requires the transition probability and, and observation probability, but we don't know these things, we don't know the model. So the main contribution of this work is basically they identify the criteria that uh, we can um, do this encapsulation approximately in terms of uh, predicting the reward as well as predicting the new approximated state or new observation. So it's, um, it's basically these maps that, uh, that, map, uh, that maps from AOH to the states that matters. And they are basically searching in certain functional space for this map and does the encapsulation well enough in terms of the criteria. Um, right. So in practical implementation, you can represent this mapping by uh, neural networks and learn the optimal policy with uh, two time scale algorithms. In the fast time scale, you will learn the mapping using neural networks with uh, loss being the aforementioned prediction loss. And in the slow time scale, you, um, you can use the uh, learning, uh, you can use the learned mapping to find the approximated states and use the states to uh, do policy gradient. So uh, back to the tiger example, if you run this algorithm in tiger, uh, at first the neural network doesn't really uh, know anything and you will sort of map everything to the same states. Then you will find that picking the door, uh, for example, picking left or right will result in a uh, uh, a minus 45 instantaneous reward in, um, in expectation while waiting only costs minus one. So the agent will quickly converge to always waiting, uh, which is actually a suboptimal policy. So the, um, our observation is uh, there is actually interdependency between the policy and your AIS. So the route of your policy you choose will affect the mapping you learn. And um, so if one is to consider a regret during the training algorithm, uh, maybe if the uh, a force exploration like epsilon grady or um, optimistic evaluation like uh, UCB will, uh, will be needed to encourage the explorations. Yeah. That's uh, all for my part. <laughs> Thank you for this. This is uh, uh, quite a good observation. I'd actually like to start by a comment about this tiger environment, that this is really the bald sequential hypothesis testing um, model. So it goes much, much before the 96 or 97 paper, which introduced the tiger environment. Um, and uh, but more seriously, I completely agree with your observation that uh, in general, for getting the any RL algorithm to work, we do need exploration. In our models, we haven't explicitly used exploration. We do get some exploration from the choice of our uh, approximation, approximate P and R that we were using these as softmax or multimodal Gaussian distribution. So this, these are not deterministic, but at times we will take random actions, but this is not systematic exploration and adding systematic exploration to these models uh, will definitely improve the uh, rate of convergence. Thank you. So if you're done, maybe you can uh, stop sharing screen and then uh, yeah, Deng Wang can do I've it. Stopped. Thanks. <laughs> Deng Wang, you're... Yeah. Okay, let, let me start. Okay, so I, I will just briefly provide a few comments on, on, on paper. So, uh, in this paper, the idea is very clear. So first we consider information state of a POM DP, information state as it, as it is defined in the literature 
is something that is sufficient for evaluating the instantaneous reward and sufficient for predicting the future self. And the sufficient condition for the second one, the, the second one can be replaced by the condition that this state evolves actually like a state and also it is sufficient for predicting observations. So you can use this condition too. And the idea of approximate information state is to relax these two conditions. It's to say that the, uh, this information state has a compression of the history is sufficient for evaluating instantaneous reward up to an error of epsilon. And it is sufficient for predicting its future self within an error of F, uh, delta. And this delta is in terms of the distance between distributions. So uh, in one sentence, the paper tells us that approximate information state based dynamical programming give us approximately optimal policies. And the paper also spells out the non-asymptotic guarantee. So when you have epsilon and delta, you, you then have a guarantee of alpha, which is spelled out in the paper. The paper, uh, it doesn't just give you some convergence result. It gives you the exact bond. And the paper also adapts uh, this to distributed pom dp where they use a common information approach and then apply to the coordinated problem. And also they applied this concept to reinforcement learning. So this paper provides a general theoretical framework for approximation of control problems. And it has wide amount of applications. So here are my questions. The first question that I'm interested in is that uh, the paper requires the estimation of uh, expected reward to be close for every history. I think Vijay have asked a similar question. So maybe there are a lot of history. Maybe some history are more rare than the others and we don't care about those mm -hmm. rare ones. How about, for example, considering uh, this conditional expectation and this conditional expectation to be close in, for example, L2 instead of L infinity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, as I mentioned uh, when during Vijay's question, also, uh, we, we have some back of the envelope calculations there. Mm -hmm. uh, what you get, so what you can do is you can let the epsilon and delta be history dependent. Uh, uh, there, yeah. there would still be, so there is a Row of v hat the row of v hat that we get in the bound, and mm -hmm. that part will still have to take the uniform bound over that. So we'll still have to work with the Lipschitz constant of the value function, uh, not necessarily the, the Lipschitz constant at a particular point because that's a universal bound. Um, <clears throat> But some of the, uh, uh, all of the terms in the bounds can, other terms in the bound can be written in terms of epsilon delta and integration over uh, the next realization of state and so on. So mm -hmm. some versions of these can be constructed. Mm -hmm. uh, for the MDP case, we had the complete analysis. At some stage, we sort of did just do the calculations for PO MDPs. For POMDPs, you, you have to do something else to make the result more meaningful. And what I mean by that is the following, that if we expect to get a bound between the value function at the current history and the value function at the information state corresponding to the current history. Uh -huh. So if I did not approximate all the histories well, then this worst case bound can be terrible. So I'll have to look at some form of average error between V of HT and V of Sigma HT uh -huh. with respect to some, yeah. uh, some distribution. Yes, so some. one would need to add that additional component there that I need to have some distribution over my histories 
or for MDP sub distribution over my states. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is also a design parameter now because the choice of that distribution determines how good or bad uh, approximation error I have. Uh, so this would be the weight function if you were thinking in terms of L2, for example. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so as far as the main mechanics go, I believe everything goes through. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't done all the calculations for POMDPs, but one still needs to think carefully about what type of bounds will be meaningful in this setup. Yeah. Aditya, I had a, just a genuine uh, question, but I mean, so these histories would be policy dependent as well, right? So, in, yes. in a way, and, yes. so how, so I guess, wouldn't that be, uh, I mean, a problematic thing in some ways? What do you, what, what measure are you going to average over in some Well, sense? I, my yeah. idea is that there's some history, whatever policy you use, there is some history that just doesn't have it that often, whatever policy you use. Or for example, you have some idea about the optimum policy that the optimum policy will not be like some weird policy. And there are some places where only weird policy will, will go to. Yeah, yeah, probably there, you have some idea about which history have no. I was actually thinking about it much, much more simply. So I'm saying pick any policy independent measure on histories and you'll get a result according to that. So it's easier to think if this was a state rather than history. Uh, and suppose I was working with L2. So I just need to have a weight function for every state and then say my L2 norm with respect to that weight function is small. So I can just pick any weight function and my all the terms in my errors will be with respect to that weight function. Now for the result to be meaningful, that weight function should be related to say, for example, the steady state distribution of the Markov chain or something. Mm -hmm. And these types of ideas are used in, for example, least squares value iteration, uh, where one uses steady state distribution, but you don't know the steady state distribution till you pick the policy. So you do some kind of like proxy for steady state distribution and then go and see if this was okay, otherwise improve that. But the distribution, I believe, would have to be a policy independent uh, distribution fixed before I start doing my approximation. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, uh, so, first of all, Aditya, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I have a question I think related to what VJ asked. Uh, so, I think in principle, uh, like in, in your in AIS encoder, you only use uh, previous uh, time step information. And in principle, you can use like a multi-step history information to- uh, uh, information Sorry if that was over, but clear. We are using the entire history there. For the AIS encoder, this is the, all the history of observations and actions until that time. Yeah, but in that, we'll have the issue like VJ talked about because that history is under a specific policy. Mm -hmm. So then that you then need to lift the decision of the, the action space as well? Because your action space now consider a sequence of actions, right? Not just one action. So could you repeat that? I, I sort of don't, um, I didn't understand the question. Uh, I'm thinking like one way to uh, like, include a multi-step of history is to lift the action space as well. So the action is not just one step action, but a multi-step action. Then again, you have state action pair in that sense. Uh, but if you don't oh. lift the action space and just use the entire history, then uh, that history is from a given policy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh. that, that would be problematic, uh, maybe. Yes, so that is an issue. Um, so what is the way we are implementing it, what is happening is that the AIS approximation that we are learning corresponds to a good approximation for the uh, part of the state space which is visited under the current policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what helps us is that typically in reinforcement learning like algorithms, you start with, a, because we have no knowledge of what a good policy would be, the 
uh, policy network is initialized in such a way that the initial policy is completely random. So right. in the beginning, you are doing a random walk and then sort of things uh, in the, in theory, the multi time scale thing takes care of it. But in practice, we don't like, um, we are not doing our step size updates according to the theory. So there is, uh, there is a possibility that the way we have implemented the algorithm uh, may not work. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing something, doing the exploration in a more systematic way or constructing the initial map in the more systematic way are interesting ideas. Um, I do not have a concrete answer to that. Uh, the usual difficulty with this is that similar to, for example, what Sue had presented with the Tiger problem, that there may be part of the state space which gives you small reward and you are happy getting those small rewards so you do not explore and you, you have maybe have a very good prediction for that part of the model and you never even decide to visit part of the state space which could have much higher rewards and but because that's not part of your model you are not visiting that so one would need uh, different ways in order to uh, prevent that type of uh, local uh, getting fixed in a particular point due to uh, using like a certainty equivalent policy. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's very good to understand. That. Also, I'm thinking whether there's a possibility to generate your framework in a way such that uh, we can lift to the action space and state space, like make multiple frame as a single frame. Uh, then in that case, you actually capture partial history. Then uh, how large the frame is uh, may depend on like how quick the correlation decay uh, of the underlying Markov system, right? If the uh, correlation decay is very fast uh, over states, then uh, like if you have fast mixing, then you don't need a large frame. Uh, yes, so, so there's a recent paper by uh, uh, Serdar Yuxil and uh, um, Ali, um, I don't remember the full name of the student uh, who Ali Sina, who who proposed uh, something very similar to this mm -hmm. in terms of the mixing coefficient of the Markov chain. They characterize how big the history of observations should be. Uh, so, what's the trade-off between the size of the history? and the mixing coefficient in terms of what's the quality of approximation. And I believe that that type of a framework can also be viewed through the uh, lens of an approximate information state, uh, though their work does use ideas similar to what uh, Dongwe was uh, presenting that we have to use a rather than having a uniform bound, they have a non-uniform bound at uh, different parts of the state space. I see. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. So, yeah, my next question is, is, is kind of vague, but the value function of the approximate information state for me, it, it just looks like a function in a lower dimensional space. If you have a function of something smaller than this equivalent to function have smaller dimensions. Is okay. there a possible yes. relationship between the API and the functional approximations such as in q -learn? Um That is something I have not thought about. Um, I agree that uh, in terms of construction, these are similar. So mm -hmm. there may be some kind of a relationship, um, but uh, I'll need to think about it. I don't have an opinion on the top of my head. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let, let me go back. 
go to the next one. So the potential future work, why is a system design problem induced from this work? So that, for example, if you are given a budget of alpha of total error, uh, maybe an interesting question is how to apportion, how to distribute the errors to each time and to the estimation of reward and the estimation of next distribution so that you have a good AIS, for example, the, the size of the space is small. Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, Maybe in some specific problems, one can uh, see this. I, I think this may be a yeah, right, so this is, yeah, you're basically asking if I had a finite horizon model, is it good to have a good model at the beginning or good model at the end? Yeah, I also, could, if you have an infinite horizon, does it maybe assign more weight to delta or to epsilon? You know, uh, which yes. one should you put so, more? For the infinite horizon model in, I mean, we did not specifically explore this in detail, mm -hmm. but our intuition while doing the hyperparameter tuning was that delta dominates epsilon, that it actually did not ah. matter almost if we did not give any weight to epsilon in, ah. the, in, in some of our experiments. I see. Um, like we were, uh, again, I'll have to double check it. This is from memory, but I think our, so we had a weight on epsilon squared term and a weight on delta squared term and the weight on epsilon squared term is like 0.1 and 0 0.01. <laughs> so, these are really, really small weights to epsilon. I see. And part of the reason is in in most of the environments that we studied, the uh -huh. reward is actually can be is a deterministic function of the observation. I see. The reward is the easy part. No, because no, it is so. The couple of things in the numerical experiments that we studied, I in the paper we have two versions of AIS. I only presented one. In the numerical experiments, we actually used predicting uh, uh, observations rather than predicting uh, AIS, uh, which is a bit more, uh, uh, which, which is a different way of looking at this as well. And in that version, the re reward can be computed as a function of the observation. So it's, it's a mixture of all those things. We did not explore this carefully as to what is a good choice of weight between epsilon and delta. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me wrap up. So another thing I have in mind is a further application to decentralized control. You have one application in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remind Hamid Tawagofi's work, where in his work, he, he has a team problem where one can also compress private information into something called sufficient private information. I suspect that you can apply the similar idea to define approximate sufficient private information and yeah, basically apply the idea of uh, approximation, approximated information state to that work in terms of applying it on the private part, the sufficient private information. I think in, in the paper, you apply it on the common information part. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I definitely agree that uh, there are multiple other, I mean, we are just, in the paper, we were all just presenting a very, very simple corollary of our result to, uh, uh, to um, decentralized control problem. Mm -hmm. There, there are, many other aspects of approximations in decentralized models which haven't been explored. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the question of if you could, as you're mentioning, if you could approximate the sufficient private information. Uh, another mm -hmm. thing which I have thought of for a while but I don't have an answer to is, uh, what if there is no common information but agents pretend there is common information because the difference between the two informations was very small. 
Uh, that, that's very interesting. Yeah, in the formal setting of common information work, that means you cannot do do too much, but maybe we can do something over there. Yeah, right. So in, in game theory, there is this notion of epsilon common knowledge, which is well defined, well studied, and so on. If uh -huh. there are if there is a way in which epsilon common knowledge can be yeah. incorporated uh, there. Yeah. By the way, the epsilon common knowledge thing is a little pessimistic in the game theory. I think they say that sometimes epsilon have to be zero for something to happen. There are famous examples yes, but, there. Yeah, but it 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 depends on that, right? Like. Yeah. So you can construct examples where there may be some common knowledge, but with high probability and not always, or other types of approximations that if we think of, say, in linear systems where you could think of your information as a vector in a linear space, that the two vectors are close to one another, but not necessarily aligned, um, are there some things that can be done in those things? So I think in general, Approximation for multi-agent systems is wide open. Uh, we are just beginning to scratch the surface here. There are a lot mm -hmm. of other things which can be done. Yeah, sure. And the last one is application to dynamic games. And yeah, especially in dynamic games, as I have talked to you in the morning, if you want to use exact information state, sometimes it doesn't have a solution. It doesn't have equilibrium when you try to compress things into the exact information state. But there may be mm -hmm. some hope that you can get approximate uh, equilibrium in terms of approximate information state. Uh, yes, um, I agree. I am not super familiar with the approximation results even for like uh, Markov games. Uh, I know there are some results for zero sum games, but I believe in general, uh, you could have a family of results of the form that if you use mm -hmm. an epsilon information state instead of the true uh, information state, mm -hmm. you will get some relaxed Nash equilibria, so some epsilon Nash equilibria or other forms of relaxation. Um, but I am not familiar with what is there in the literature with approximations and uh, Certainly, there is not anything for games with asymmetric information, but even in games with symmetric information, I don't know how much approximation results there are. I see. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this is well uncharted waters to me, at least. Yeah. Yes. So maybe I, I saw it here. Does anyone have any questions? I know we are running very late. I just wanted to give, I mean, I had one, but I wanted to give people a chance to ask anything if they wanted to. Well, if not, then I'll go ahead and ask Aditya. So the question I had was more, um, so <clears throat> so this has a, has a uh, I mean, you're approximating a transition kernel Mm -hmm. Plus, you're also approximating sort of a cost in a way. So there is a sense of a rate distortion type viewpoint, but in sort of a cost, is there a way to study it using that framework or not? There might this trade -off be. I... Between, trade off between delta and epsilon or in some other formal way of looking at this problem. There should be, I, I haven't thought about that, but there, sh there should definitely uh, be something. Um, I mean, the natural rate distortion analog would be if I want an approximation error to be less than uh, something, like even, um, yeah, so you, you can answer the following question. If I did not do any reward approximation in an MDP, uh, the form DP would require a bit more careful analysis. But in an MDP, if I had the right reward function, I can ask how much can I distort my transition kernel mm -hmm. such that my error does not go beyond some kappa. And that will be like an inverse formula, but the way we have things that will depend on uh, the value function of the approximate model.
but we can get, get similar results in terms of value function of the true model as well. Things will just be flipped around. So it might be able to characterize some of those things. Uh, but when both the reward and these are uh, not known, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I'd, I'd need to, to think about that uh, on uh, what type of characterizations there would be. And in particular, if there is any notion of asymptotics there, like mm -hmm. the like the rate distortion uh, gives you, like also gives you a achievable and a converse. Yes. Yeah. I am just using upper bound, right? There is no notion of converse in what I have done. Mm -hmm. that, uh, because my bound is actually very, very loose. So what would also be interesting is if there is a converse in these models, yeah. that you can say that with this type of approximation, you are not going to get below between epsilon, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so those are uh, that's a very interesting thing, but I don't have an answer. That's okay. Anyway, so uh, thanks so much, and I think we went took you long past your time, and we went. No, that's fine. Right. Yeah, I really enjoyed that, and uh, thanks for all the questions and the discussion. This was uh, super interesting. Thank you thanks very again. much, Aditya. Excellent talk. Uh, thank. You. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Good night. Yeah, have a nice evening. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.